Hello, my name is Magnus Petersen. This talk is about annual fixed rebalancing between the S&P 500 and US government bonds. The talk is based on this book and you can click on the image or on the link below the video. During the period 1978 to 2013, the average annualized return was almost 6% for US government bonds with one year maturity. The bond returns are guaranteed by the government of the United States. The average annualized return for the S&P 500 was 11 to 13 percent approximately, depending on the investment duration. This was about twice as much as the U.S. government bonds, but the S&P 500 was also very volatile, with a standard deviation of 17.3 percent, and the greatest annual gain was over 70 percent, and the greatest annual loss was almost half. We can rebalance our portfolio between the S&P 500 and US government bonds to lower the volatility. Let's consider an example. Let's say we have $2,000 and we invest $1,000 in the S&P 500, so we get a 50-50 allocation. If the S&P 500 drops 20% or $200, and this is offset slightly by a 2% dividend or $20, then after a year we have $820 left of the thousand dollars invested in the S&P 500. We also invested a thousand dollars in US government bonds and let's say they had a five percent yield so after a year we would have a thousand and fifty dollars and the entire portfolio would be thousand and fifty dollars plus the eight hundred twenty dollars from the stock investment and the total is one thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars. So we lost a hundred and thirty dollars. But if we had invested everything in the S&P 500, then we would have lost $360. So the loss is not quite as bad. After the year is over, we rebalance the portfolio to 50-50 again, so that 50% of the $1,870 or $935 is invested in the S&P 500, and another $935 is invested in US government bonds. If we consider all possible starting dates during the period 1978 to 2013 and all investment periods up to 10 years, then we get many thousand different combinations of starting dates and investment durations and we can summarize the annualized returns using a box plot. So for one year of investing, we would have a median annualized return almost 10%. And the lowest would be something like minus 22% and the highest would be around plus 40%. And for a 10 year investment period, the median annualized re return would be something like 11% and there would be no losses. Um, the minimum annualized return would be slightly over zero and the greatest one would be slightly below 15%, I think. And we can also show this data in a table so here we have the years of investing. Here we have the minimum annualized return. We have the mean here and the median here and the maximum here, the quartiles, the standard deviation and some probabilities, which I will describe in more detail in another slide. So for example, let's say we invest for two years and then we consider all the investment periods of two years during this time interval here, 1978 to 2013. So if we use the 50-50 rebalancing scheme, the lowest annualized return would be an annual loss of 11.7%. The greatest would be 22.7% and the average would be 9.1%. For 10 years of investing with a 50-50 rebalancing, the minimum annualized return would be 0.5%. The maximum would have been 14.4% and the mean would be 8.9%. So this is historical for this period here, 1978 to 2013. So let's look at the long-term relative performance between the S&P 500, which is the red line here, and this has the dividends reinvested. So after a year, we get some dividends on the S&P 500, we reinvest it in the S&P 500, and then after a year, we do the same and so on and so on. And this is also called the total return. And the black line here is for the 50-50 rebalancing scheme. And the blue line is for an investment in US government bonds. And we can clearly see that the rebalancing 
was somewhere in the middle between US government bonds and the S&P 500. But the question is, is this always the case? And it is not. So here's an example where the rebalancing is a lot better than the S&P 500 and the rebalancing is worse than government bonds. So in this period, the S&P 500 had two crashes. The first one was in the period between year 2000 and 2003, and the other one was around year 2008 and 9. Here's an example where the rebalancing is worse than the S&P 500, and it is better than the US government bonds. So we have again the bonds down here in the blue line, and we have the rebalancing as a black line and the S&P 500 as a red line here. This was a period of great bull market for the S&P 500. And because only half of our portfolio was invested in the S&P 500, we only got about half the return plus half of the return of the bond. So let's look at the probability of underperformance. This is for the 50-50 rebalancing and it's cut out from the table uh, from one of the previous slides. So out here we have the years of investing, 1, 2, 10. And here we have the probability of loss. So for a, an investment period of one year, the probability of loss using the 50-50 rebalancing strategy would be 0.13 or 13%. And the probability of loss gradually decreased. So for 10 years of investing, the 50-50 rebalancing strategy had zero probability of loss. This is really a historical frequency for the period 1978 to 2013. This may not be the probability for future losses. We can also see the probability that the rebalancing strategy performed worse than the bond only investment. And for a one year investment period, it was 0.25 or 25%. And this also gradually decreased. And for 10 years of investing, the probability had decreased to 9%. The rebalancing strategy with 50% stock and 50% bond often performed worse than a full investment in the S&P 500. And for one year of investing, the probability was 75%. But, and for 10 years of investing, it was 85%. The conclusion is that the rebalancing strategy had average annualized returns between the S&P 500 and US government bonds. But the rebalancing also had lower probability and magnitude of loss than a full investment in the S&P 500. Rebalancing is better than a full investment in the S&P 500 for short-term investing because the risk of losing a lot of your money is lower. The talk was based on this book over here and you can click on the image or the link below the video. And the book also contains studies for 25% stock and 75% bonds and the inverse 75% stock and 25% bonds. So you can see what the performance is for those strategies.